wasn't, as I say, my style. Immediately, meaning in 10 minutes, I grasped that the King Wen's sequence is not 64 hexagrams, it's 32 pairs of hexagrams, because the second member of each pair is the first turned upside down. Claro? Good. Nothing to it. So, I had ch the, the nature of the problem has now changed. The question now is, what is the ordering principle which governs these 32 pairs of hexagrams? And this did not come so easily. I looked, and finally the voice said to me, look at the first order of difference. And I said, what is the first order of difference? And it said, <clears throat> the number of lines that change as you move from one hexagram to the next. Stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, <laughs> okay, we'll look at the first order of difference. So now, as you probably know, the first hexagram is the creative, six solid lines. The second hexagram is the receptive, six broken lines. What is the first order of difference? Six, right. Oh, oh I didn't say that um, the first rule is that they occur in pairs where the second member of the pair is the first inverted. But if inverting the first one causes no change, as would occur in eight cases, then all lines change. That's very logical and intuitive and clear, I think. And you meet that first exception in the first pair. The first hexagram is six unbroken lines. Obviously, inverting it makes no difference. So you invoke the second rule. If inversion makes no difference, all lines change. Right? OK. So I looked at the first order of difference. Now, the first order of difference logically can be one, two, three, four, five, or six. When you actually look at what it is in the King Wen sequence, the first thing you notice is that there are no fives. This is an artificiality. This is the thumbprint of human intent. Because when you program a computer to arrange these hexagrams randomly and to chart the first order of difference, First order difference values of five are very common. There is no, nothing in principle to exclude them, but for some reason they were excluded from the King Wen sequence. The other thing I noticed was that the ratio of odd to even values of the first order of difference came out to be exactly three to one. Three even to one odd. This again is the thumbprint of human intent randomly arranged sequences don't have this property. So I, I didn't know what this meant. I, it just seemed like, yes, maybe we were becoming sinologists and exploring the construction principles in a forgotten Chinese oracle. Um, but then it suggested to me that I make a graph of the first order of difference. So I made a graph. 64 points down, six points across, graph the first order of difference. Six, two, four, three, one, six, one, three, etc. When I made this graph and looked at it, it appeared rather stochastic, meaning it appeared random. Uh, no, no pattern of order jumped out until I noticed something very interesting, which was that the first three data points were a mirror image of the last three data points. Now what this means is if we were to take a copy of this wave and rotate it 180 degrees in the plane, which is how mathematicians say, turn it upside down, 
if we were to rotate it 180 degrees in the plane, it would slide into itself with a perfect fit at the beginning and at the end, but nowhere in between. This is highly improbable. This is, this is uh, definitely someone sat up nights trying to make this happen, and there were many trials and errors before they got it. So I thought, well, how strange. Then here we have, what we now have is a structure, 64 hexagrams running this way, and 64 hexagrams running backward, and they arrange themselves in pairs such that they add to 64. 63 and 1, 62 and 2, 61 and 3, 60 and 4. Do you understand? Yes. So I thought, hmm, what, is, what a strange thing, a module. We've taken the entire sequence of the I Ching, run it backwards against itself, and discovered that it creates a natural topological closure. It's a natural module. A natural module. What an onomatopoetic phrase. Um, so then, the it's sort of like a super hexagram. It has all the hexagrams in it running both ways. It has 384 yao in it, yao or lines. 6 times 64 equals 384. Uh, and then the teaching voice said, take this module and use it as the lowest level of a larger module hierarchy based on the I Ching. In other words, take this module and treat it as a line, a line in a hexagram. Okay, so I drew this little structure with its closure, and then I made six copies of it, and I laid them end to end on my bedroom floor. What my friends were thinking about me during this period is another story, but I'm just giving you the raw shtick here. So I laid six of these structures end to end and said, aha, these are like the six lines of a hexagram. And then the voice said, yes, but a hexagram is more than six lines. A hexagram is two trigrams. The learning curve here is steep, but bear with me. Um, so I took my little structure, my little module, and I blew it up by a power of three. And over the six, I laid two more, generated from the same origin point, but proportionately three times larger. Do you understand? Yes. So then I looked at this. And then the voice said, but a hexagram is more than six lines and more than two trigrams. A hexagram has a unitary wholeness that is hexagrammatic. I said, okay. So I made a great big version of my little module. And over the six and over the two, I laid this higher level the big one. So now what I have is a three-level structure with one module on the top, two modules in the middle, and six modules on the bottom. And I drew this thing with a rapidograph, uh, believe it or not, in the confines of my smoky room. <laughs> and. Um, <coughs> What you get if you do this is a shitload of wavy lines uh, running in all directions and crossing over each other. And I, I had no idea what this thing was for. And the voice assured me that this was somehow a gestalt symbol of time, of time. And so I began 
meditating and thinking about this and looking at the numerology of this structure. Well, remember that I mentioned that it had 384 yao, 384 lines, which are the 6 times 64 number? This is an interesting number, 384, because it turns out to be uh, within a fraction of a day, 13 lunations. Lunations are 29 point something days, and 13 of them are 383.89 days. So I said, hmm, 13 lunations. This thing is a calendar of some sort. It's a, it's a lunar calendar. Uh, it must have been developed somewhere in southern China where seasonality wasn't so important because it would precess 19 days against the solar year length of 365 days. But it would keep perfect lunar time, you know, with er an error that would accumulate to about one day every hundred years or something. Very good for a Neolithic calendar. But then the voice said, yes, but there's more. I said, okay, well, so, then I sat with it, and it said, take the number 384 days and multiply it by other numbers that are natural to the I Ching. So I took 384 days, and I multiplied it times 64. And I discovered that this is 67 years, 104.25 days, and I noticed that that is six sunspot cycles of 11 years, assigning one sunspot cycle to each line of a hexagram. I also, in then researching sunspot cycles, I discovered that there is not only an 11-year sunspot cycle, there is also a 33-year major sunspot cycle, which would naturally fall to each trigram. And I then learned that the ancient Chinese were the first people in the world to observe sunspots. They were observing sunspots through smoked pieces of obsidian, A.D. 1500, B.C. 1500. Interesting. So then I, I went further. I took the number 67 years, 104.25 days, and I multiplied it by 64, and I got 4,306 years, a period of time that effectively assigns one trigram to each zodiacal age of 2,200 years. And again, I learned that the ancient Chinese were the first people to notice the precession of the equinox, which is a very large 26,000-year cycle that uh, repeats itself. So I thought, you know, this is very far out. Now notice that all of these phenomena that are being coordinated by this set of resonant numbers are uh, naked eye phenomena, lunations, sunspots, and the precession of the equinox. This can all be observed with the naked eye. We're not hypothesizing some advanced technology. We're just hypothesizing advanced conscious thinking about mathematical problems. So, uh, you know, this is obscure. I thought maybe I could publish an article in Sky and Telescope or Archaeology or something, I Ching linked to ancient Neolithic resonance calendar. Not the sort of thing that would move you to the edge of your chair in most cases. <laughs> but I had the very strong conviction when I looked at this wavy structure, this three-level structure that I described to you, the very strong conviction that somehow this was very important, that it was, uh, that I had not gone far enough, and that this was somehow a picture of time. And I began to think about time, and I began to try and understand it the way the ancient Chinese understood it, the way the people who created and inherited the I Ching 
understood it. And I came by you know, reading a lot of Chinese philosophy and translation to see that the Chinese have a completely different view of time from the Western thing. And I want to now make a little caesura here and, and, and background you in this. The uh, scientific view of time is what is called pure duration. It was defined by Newton. Essentially, time is simply what you have in order that things can happen. You know, it's a featureless, abstract, mathematical dimension. It's not a thing in the world. It's an idea. It's an idea. And that notion of time, that it is featureless and perfectly smooth, probabilistically, persisted up until 1905 when there were some minor adjustments made in it by Einstein, who added the caveat that in the presence of massive gravitational bodies, the perfectly smooth surface is given a very, very slight curvature. Now, this idea of time is central and indispensable to science because Western science is built on the implications of the concept of experiment and the deduction of data out of experimental procedure depends fundamentally on the assumption slash belief that the time when the experiment is performed is irrelevant. Do you understand what I mean? So that when somebody says the speed of light is x, they cannot add on Tuesdays and Thursdays, <laughs> but on Monday through, you know. In other words, experimental data is assumed to be time dependent, and the underlying philosophical assumption there then is that time is this perfectly smooth, featureless surface which can always be given a zero value with confidence. That's how science does its work. All right. The Chinese idea, it could hardly be more different. The Chinese idea is closer to our notion of how matter works. Uh, the scientific idea about matter developed in the West is that matter is made up of elements and these elements at a certain level of energy are irreducible. They cannot be changed into each other. We now know that at, in the nuclear level they can be changed into each other. But at the level of ordinary chemical process, elements are fundamental. And there are 106 or 7 or 8 of them. And uh, all material phenomena are built up out of these 108 elements. The Chinese notion of time is very similar to this. It's the idea not that time is a philosophical abstraction, but that time is a very diffuse but real medium, somewhat the way we conceive of an electromagnetic field, and that time is composed of elements and that these elements are irreducible, and that there is a finite number of them, not 108, as we believe about the elements of matter, but guess what? 64. 64 temporal elements. Think of them as 64 species of happenstance. And the Chinese idea is that the world of ongoing becoming, the phenomenal world undergoing the formality of occurring, is an interference pattern created by the interplay and intermeshing and intermingling of these temporal elements, these temporal species. So that then the theory of the I Ching is it's sort of like sticking a dipstick into an engine to see the level of the oil. You throw the I Ching 
and the universal temporal flux that is flowing by at many speeds on many levels, you like perform a measurement on it. You take an average, as it were, and you discover, you know, hexagram 49 changing to 13 or whatever it is. It's a gestalt readout of the immediate situation in the temporal flux. Do you see? So, um, and it's a completely different idea from the idea about time in the West because what it says is that time is as important as space, that uh, you never have the same set of conditions twice. The perfectly smooth Aristotelian surface of time established by Newton is seen to be a fiction. And now notice that Western science began with Aristotelian objects, perfect circles, perfect cubes, and the, uh, the Copernican revolution in astronomy was essentially the getting rid of perfect circles in the Ptolemaic system. One by one, the perfect philosophical objects of Greek mathematics had to be discarded. The only one we've hung on to up until the present moment is this myth of the perfectly smooth surface of time in, contra in, in, in contraposition to this Chinese position. Now, think about your own experience. What we experience is much more like what the Chinese say time is like. We experience surges of connection and coincidence, and then dry spells. We experience uh, waves of synchronicity, and everything seems to go right, then everything seems to go wrong. We don't seem to be living on a perfectly flat probabilistic plane. We seem to be living in a kind of heaving ocean of synchronicity and probability and uncertainty and so forth and so on. Okay, close paragraph. Back to the rap. Um, this three-leveled thing that I had created, I had the very strong intuition that it was describing this ebb and flow that I'm talking about. And uh, you could, I could have used Taoist terminology I could have called it the Tao wave or something like that, but I, I wanted to anchor it in a metaphysic that I knew was mathematically secure. So I adopted the vocabulary of uh, Alfred North Whitehead, who I think is one of the great neglected geniuses of the 20th century. I mean, I think you can throw away your Sanskrit dictionaries, folks. It was all done in good Oxfordian English uh, by Whitehead. Um, and in a book called Process and Reality, which is his masterpiece, he develops at great length the concept of novelty and the idea that the universe is an ebb and flow of novelty, that the way to think of reality is as a kind of dynamic tension between two forces, which uh, I've adapted from Whitehead and then following a suggestion of Rupert Sheldrake's, I call these two forces habit and novelty. And habit and novelty are locked in eternal dynamic uh, tension. Every time there's a surge of novelty, it's eventually quenched and halted by a reversion to habit. Every time there is an accumulation of constipated habit, tradition, uh, repetition, entropy, it's eventually perturbed by an outbreak of novelty. And this happens on every time scale. It happens on a scale of billions of years. It happens on a scale of microseconds. Habit, novelty, habit, novelty. But, and here's the good news, 
It is in fact not an eternal struggle because over eons of time, novelty is winning. Novelty is winning. It is slowly accumulating. Novelty builds upon previously established foundations of novelty. Now previously in the weekend I used the word complexity because I hadn't explained this term. But can you see how it works? It's that upon the atoms, which are novel when they first appear, come the molecules, a new form of novelty. Upon the rules of molecular construction can be built long chain polymers, a, a deeper emergence into novelty. Upon those long chain polymers can be built self-replicating molecules like DNA that are the basis for life, deeper descent into novelty. <laughs> Upon DNA can be built uh, complex membranes, multicellular animals, life as we know it, deeper advance into novelty. And upon the platform of organic life rises the platform of higher mammalian organization. And upon the platform of higher mammalian organization arises the platform of self-reflecting primate consciousness. And upon that platform is built an electronic globe-girdling civilization that can hurl instruments outside the solar system and measure the temperatures in, at, of distant stars. Novelty is winning. Now, one more thing to notice about this. Each stage of advance into novelty happens faster than the stage which preceded it. This is not a curve like this into novelty, or like this, steeply descending into novelty. It's a curve like this. It's a spiral, where each turn of the spiral happens at a rate of collapse 1 64th that of the length of the previous spiral. And these were the things which were whispered to me by this disembodied voice during this period of time when my friends were holding meetings about whether it should be the tranquilizing dart or <laughs> physical overwhelmment. Terrence, how does it become at 64th as fast each time? I mean, was that, is that speculation? I mean, well, I'll show you when I get to it on the computer here. Yeah. It almost seems to be like evolutionary change. Yes. And then when you say the circles are, that would be like circle on top of circle, level on top of level, growing and growing. Think of it as an involuting spiral that's going faster and faster <laughs> toward an omega point. Um, okay. Now, if you haven't understood anything so far, it's all right, because uh, <clears throat> as you'll see, uh, so I had all these convictions about time and all these ideas, and I was just a buzz with it. I mean, I was frightening to people. I could hold people prisoner for 16 hours at a stretch. I didn't sleep often. I would hold forth. I mean, I was I was not publicly presentable. It's <laughs> it's taken this long to get it dialed down into a user friendly. Uh, piece of entertainment rather than a burning-eyed hysterical <laughs> rave. But I, I, so I had this occult diagram, this three-level wavy system of lines, and I would carry it around like a scroll and show it to people. It was about eight feet long and say, you know, this is a map of time. This is a map of hyperspace. This is uh, uh, an intellectual achievement on the scale of uh, the wheel or something, and it's been passed down. Uh, you know, I was on Mount Sinai, and here's what the burning bush said. And most people just turned away aghast. Uh, but my friend Ralph Abraham said to me, he said, you know, this thing is just an occult diagram. Only you can interpret it. it. It means nothing to anybody else. What you have to do is you have to turn it in to an, an ordinary mathematical object of some sort. He said, all, 
objects, all topologies can be transformed into other topologies, you must take this thing and turn it into a normal mathematical object of some sort. Well, essentially, this was like telling a turtle to fly. I mean, I'm not a mathematician. Remember the stabbing? So, so I just thought, you know, well, this is a kind of a death sentence on this rap because orthodox research mathematicians lock their doors when they know I'm coming. And uh, I don't have the head to do this. I do not even know where to begin on such a task. And so I sat with it for like three years. And then one afternoon in Berkeley, I was just, I was getting loaded, and, as I usually do. And um, I saw how it could be done. Just within 30 seconds, I saw how this complex occult mathematical thing could be turned into an ordinary fractal wave that could be displayed on a Cartesian graph and time scaled. And I just, and I made notes and, and went through it and, and yes, it could be done. It could be done and all my so-called occult intuitions about the wave were preserved in the new mathematical object that I had created that, w that uh, uh, perfectly preserved everything about the other way. I hesitated because I think that I created is a misnomer. I mean, this stuff was just downloaded as fast as I could listen to it, and I felt no responsibility for it at all. I mean, I was just sitting there going, uh-huh, 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 I see, yes, right, 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 like that. We created the first simulations, time-scaled simulations of the wave on uh, CDC 6400 at Cal in Fortran on punch cards in 1975-4. And then in 77, small computers came along and uh, we've been modeling and working with this thing ever since. Now, if you didn't understand any of that, it's okay, the next part is still fun. All you need to know is that through some kind of mumbo jumbo having to do with the I Ching, I claim to have a wave which describes history. That's it, because here's the thing. This theory, unlike any theory to emerge out of the occult or the new age in this century, this theory can be tested and overthrown by ordinary means. In other words, this theory wants to play with the big boys. This is a mathematically anchored theory that makes a fundamental attack on scientific ontology in its own terms, in its own terms. And the test is history. No one has ever been able to model history predictively. No one has ever been able to predict the future accurately. And I maintain that within the terms that I will establish in the rest of the lecture, we have succeeded. And this proves my contention that what psychedelics are, are tools for entry into a higher mathematical superspace. They are not intrinsically about the human psyche. They are about something much more fundamental to the structure of the universe. They're about the way space and time and casuistry are put together. <laughs> and, and what we see when we take high doses of psychedelics is we see a higher dimensional modality in the mathematical sense, not in the metaphorical sense, but we actually are somehow liberated from the incoming sensorium of three-dimensional space and liberated into a higher dimension. Well, so now, God willing, I want to turn to the computer and, I, and say about the computer, there's nothing magical about the computer. I did all this work without computers. I mean, a rapidograph, and a hand calculator, but it was maddening.
because there are thousands and thousands of arithmetical operations demanded by the execution of this algorithm. And if you screw up in any of these uh, arithmetic moves, you'll blow the final configuration of the wave. So the computer is a guarantees accuracy. It keeps us always perfectly positioned in time. And it gives us to five decimal points uh, accurate depiction of this mathematical object. So really what the computer is, is like a camera eye that is allowing us to rove and scan at will through a, a fractal curve revealed by the mushroom and claimed by it to be a map of the ebb and flow of novelty in hyperspace. Now that would be challenging enough, I think. Uh, however, that's only half of what you have to swallow. Uh, remember how I said each stage follows more quickly than the one which preceded it? Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out then that in a system like that, eventually the stages will follow each other one upon the other very quickly. And throughout this weekend, I have hinted by implication that history represents a kind of ingression of a new epoch of laws and possibilities into the biological world. Still more so, the 20th century represents a further quickening of this process of the ingression of novelty. But since the collapse factor is 64, we're actually on a collision course <laughs> with a singularity of some sort. And the wave description of history that I'm going to show you will only correctly predict history if it is placed against the historical data in a certain unique configuration. The problem with that is, if it's a problem, is that that configuration seems to predict that the most novel moment in the history of the evolution of the cosmos lies only 18 years in the future now. Mm -hmm. And I had chosen this date based on the mathematical constraints of the theory before I learned that this date, December 21st, 2012, is the date for the close of the Mayan calendar. Now, this is an extraordinary coincidence. The only thing that I have in common with the high classic Maya is that we both used mushrooms. <laughs> is it conceivable that if you go deep enough into the mushroom, there's a kind of barcode message at the end of the hallway? And when you decipher the glyph, it says, discard before December 21st. <laughs> so I, uh, now, the, the, well, there are two things to talk about. First, I want to look at the wave with you and try to convince you that it is, if not true, at least, a, a, it's like, if it's not true, <laughs> then I've trapped a hallucination in a mathematical cage. Because it, it's, if it's not true, then it's a kind of a virtual mirage of truth. Because it seems true. It's simply that it leads to an impossible conclusion that the world is going to transform itself unrecognizable in a few incredibly intense moments, 18 years in the future. But then, once this possibility is enunciated and you begin to look around you, this seeming improbable proposition begins to make a certain kind of sense. And that's where then you have to decide ideologically where you're headed with this stuff. 
Okay, well, enough razzle dazzle. Now, Tom Rock, did you want to frame it? Um, yeah. How does that relate to like the Tibetan calendar or the Indian or the Indian calendar? They sort of had an ending time to the world. Well, the Indian calendar is cyclical but eternal. That's where you have very large cycles of time, larger and larger. This calendar is cyclical, but it's what's called a damp oscillation. You know how if you pluck the string of a, of a cello or something, it will make a tone, but it will finally run down. That's a damp oscillation. This is a picture of a damp oscillation. We could almost think of God plucking the string of universal nothingness, and out of it emanates the tone of apparent reality, which then condenses into a series of damp oscillations which push novelty toward one, and concentrate novelty toward one end of the process, and then it moves off into a higher dimension. I mean, there's the cosmology in a nutshell. Yeah. How could you reach the same conclusion on the main contact? Well, I, I reached the conclusion by fitting historical data to the wave and then simply going and looking to see where the zero point of the wave fell. What's the historical data? Well, all the historical data. I guess I should explain that. Where'd you start? In a, where's the beginning of that period? I mean, well, the cycles can be propagated backward into time to scales larger than the known age of the universe. Here's the way the game is played. First of all, let's be honest here. History is not a quantified data field. In other words, we can't say the French Revolution was a 22, the American Revolution was a 16, or something like that. History is not a quantified data field. Nevertheless, if we're going to talk about something called novelty in history, I think broad general statements will find general agreement. For example, the Italian Renaissance was very important for world history. I think anybody who wants to fight that is on a, on a loser's binge. <laughs> Here's another statement. The Greek Golden Age was very important for world history. I mean, you may not like it, you may think it's a white boy's game, some beef like that, but let's face it, you know, Greek science became Western science, which rules the world. We're not making moral value judgments here. We're just trying to look at history and say, where were the great breakthroughs which configured subsequent events? So I named two areas, the Greek, the Periclean Age of Athens, and uh, the Italian Renaissance. Well, so if you had a theory of history that predicted novelty, and it failed to predict either of those epochs as being novel, it would be reasonable to think your theory was bogus, right? Okay, so that's how the game is played. We're going to look at some history, and we're going to put the wave against it and we're going to talk about whether or not the wave, in fact, predicts the ebb and flow of novelty as we collectively, as a group, know it to have occurred. So it's like a little tour of the past six billion years with the road map of the novelty wave in hand. And we'll be looking at the landscape going by and we'll be looking at the road map, and we'll be asking the question, is this map a map of this road? That's a simple enough problem. Okay, let me see if we can get into it, and this will maybe be more clear. Can we take a short break? Yeah, let's take a short break. Take three by five cards. You need to put your address down. You don't, Brian is handing out the cards here. You don't necessarily need to use your real name. Just use a name that will get it to your P.O. box. Brian, do you want to say something about this? Yeah. Um, right now, the purpose is just to get resources, uh, the names of books, um, sources for seeds, things like that. 
Um, also to talk about events and um, historical happenings, the discovery of new things. Um, what there seems to be some major issues related to whether people want to give their names to me. Uh, I have an option to that, and that is that you can uh, send me a name and address to my P.O. box, and I'll send an uh, initial issue of this to you. That way it gives you time to get a P.O. box and a, and a fake name, or if you want to do that. If you don't want to do that, just give me your address and name. I assure you uh, complete privacy that your name and address will never leave my uh, my office, my computer, um, that type of thing, secure. Now, if you'd like to uh, get the full 12 hours of taping, this would be $80. And we're going to take names at the end of the uh, workshop uh, and pass those on to Merlin so that he would be contacting you uh, with the information. So be sure and do it today or that would be the end of it. This is not going out commercially. This will be just just for uh, us. So. I just wanted to add something about Rob Waldman's um, catalog. It's, it's a list of underground books and catalogs and future seminars coming up. So it's really informative. This is Rob Waldman's in Eugene that Tamarack just mentioned. I've been into this program. Um, somebody asked me during the break if this program was easy to use. It is easy to use. It's commercially available in this configuration, which is an MS-DOS configuration. There's also a Mac configuration. So if you don't own a computer, you don't need one of these. But here's promo for uh, with an address of a company that sells this. And the new MS-DOS advanced version contains a program that will convert Mayan dates to standard dates, standard dates to Mayan, just as a freebie. Uh, it contains uh, all kinds of research subroutines uh, that we created to search for other rare sequences, so forth and so on. If, if any of you think you might be interested in this, this same company sells the Mac version. So even if you're a Mac person, you should take this for the address. And I'll just circulate those. If this is not enough, I have more. Okay. I mean, what's the number? I'm not sure. It's $80, I think, for the advanced version. Uh, which is, I think, called 4.2, something like that. Okay, now we're going we're gonna to look at this. Uh, I, if anybody wants to come up and sit on the floor, it's fine. Unfortunately, it's a problem to see this screen for so many people, and the technology for projecting computer screens is uh, kind of mickey, so uh, just to please yourself. Okay, now... With what was said before the break as, uh, as the prolegomena, here's the deal. Prolegomena? A prolegomena comes before, an epilegomena comes after. A hapoxlegomena occurs only once. <laughs> Do you know what a hapoxlegomena is? No. It's a, a word that occurs only once in the known literature of a language. Isn't that a strange concept? Like that yeah. word. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, now let me see if I've got this puppy set up. Yeah, I'm going to hold them up. chose it to be six billion years 
today, it, it's sent, it is, is down here somewhere. The lower the line, the closer the line to this horizontal axis, the higher the novelty. This is the reverse of a stock market graph. In other words, we don't want to see it go up. We want to see it go down. And what it shows is that over the last six billion years, generally speaking, novelty has been increasing. However, there have been some major hiccups in that process. So it's not a smooth descent into novelty. Yes? <clears throat> yeah, let me, these two terms, habit and novelty. When the wave is ascending, habit is increasing. When the wave is descending, novelty is increasing. Novelty means new connections, new technologies, new languages, uh, migrations of people, uh, uh, cometary extinctions, um, surprises, the unexpected, innocence, number 25, the unexpected. Habit, on the other hand, means traditional activity, repetition of previously performed action, uh, inertia. I think the gestalt difference between these two things is fairly clear, am I right? Habit and novelty, that says it. Okay, so now uh, here's what I'm going to do to try and convince you of the power of this idea. We're going to look at the history of the Earth from the earliest Earth down to the earthquake in L.A. two weeks ago, and I will lead you through the data, and the question you should be asking yourself is something like this. This clown says that this describes the ebb and flow of novelty in history. Does it fit my personal intuitions about that subject, right? Okay, six billion years on the screen and what it's showing is that at about uh, 4,900,000,000 years ago, there was a very steep descent into novelty. This is the condensation and stabilization of the crust of the planet itself. I mean, this is literally the coming into being of the Earth here. The condensation of the Earth, the formation of oceans, I mean, there was some kind of catastrophic period before that, but here a stable planet forms. And then this period of exploration down to about 2.8 billion years ago, this ends with the earliest forms of prokaryotic life. And then, I don't know how many of you Oh, prokaryotic life is life where the DNA is naked. It's not uh, contained in a cellular membrane. That comes later. Those are called eukaryotes, and that's one of the great early transitions in terrestrial biology. But at the appearance of the, of the prokaryotes, um, oxygen began to be uh, produced as a waste product of this early form of biology, and oxygen was a toxic reducing gas. It actually threatened the evolution of early life on the planet until membranes and enzyme transfer systems could be evolved that could essentially allow life to survive in what was a toxic, oxygen-rich environment. And that's what this shows here. This is the crisis created by the accumulation of atmospheric oxygen. Once it was evolutionarily overcome, the plunge into novelty resumes with a vengeance. Now, someone could say that this is all so imprecise. I mean, we're talking hundreds of millions of years here. Yes, but we're going to close distance with the present, with ever finer and more precise uh, resolution. 
always remember that the position of the wave has been chosen so that the maximum point of novelty, the maximum singularity, rests on the, on the, uh, on the solstice moment of December 21st, 2012. That's way down here. That's the only point in the entire mathematical system that has a value of zero. It's the unique zero point. That's why the program is called Time Wave Zero. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to exercise just one of many of the program's functions, and I'm going to zoom toward the present, and we're going to see half as much time on each screen and twice as much detail. Do you understand what's happening? We're flying into the data by a magnification factor of two, and then I'll explain and interpret it as we go along. Okay, here we go. If you like, yes, it's optional. Zoom, yes. Seek minimum, no. Approach factor, two. Three billion years. 1.5 billion years. Get the idea? How it works? Now, this is, for all practical purposes, other than little globular slimes and stuff like this, this is the real history of biology on this planet. I mean, if you were to go 1.5 billion years into the past, it's dreary indeed. I mean, there is no life on the land. There's uh, life in the sea, eukaryotic, microscopic life. But this is essentially the entire picture of the thing. I'm writing a book about this, and I call the book History's Fractal Mountain, and there it is. Uh, th this is the signature of time itself. And notice that on the highest level, what this is saying is almost trivial. What it's saying is that everything has a beginning, it builds to a middle, it falls to an end, there's a period of reflection, and it's over. And now this could be uh, the, the firing of a nerve, or it could be the life of a star. It could be the history of a species, a love affair, a company takeover, an atomic explosion. In other words, it's a process. All process is embedded in other forms of process, process within process within process until you reach the highest level of the all-inclusive process called the cosmos. So what this is saying is that between 1.3 billion and 700 million years ago, roughly 800 million years ago, there was a period of uh, increasing uh, habit, increasing reversion to traditional patterns. Now, what this actually is, is life's conquest of the ocean and the filling of the ocean with uh, multiple species of life and the development and occupation of all niches in the ocean. Then, 800 million years ago, life leaves the sea. That's the symmetry break. You can see it right there. And from that point on, the conquest of the land by plant and animal life has, at this scale, been virtually a smooth cascade into novelty, although you can see that there is stochastic uh, uh, oscillation in the last 200 million years of that process. Now that, yes? If you think of, uh, just as a side thing, if you think of uh, novelty as um, the hexagram of innocence, then you might think of the other condition as number 12, stagnation. Yeah, that's okay. good. That would be an analog. That's good. Okay. Um, okay, so 
this is basically the picture of the career of biology on this planet. And notice that it has a period of fluctuation around the mean, but then about 60 million years ago, it falls to an entirely new level of novelty, and then the mathematical details are lost in the compression of the data field. But we can explode them. It's so much fun to say stuff like that. <laughs> What's happening historically, so or do you have to? Do, you, do we have to know all of that biological this history? Is, this is a menu. Well, what I'm trying to do is find a CD-ROM company who will give me a pile of money so that I can build a huge image-based chronological database, so that by just pointing at a place on the wave, we would be flooded with fossils, armor, battle maps, uh, text, you know, like that. I haven't yet crossed that Rubicon. Berkeley Mac Club. I've got their own CD-ROM out and have all the equipment to do that. Yeah, well, I've been through the mill. It's as weird as Hollywood, the world of multimedia. I mean, if I had a dollar for every million that's been tossed around in conversation, I could buy a VCR. Uh, okay. Now, this is the last 375 million years. The last 375 million years. Now, some of you who are students of, uh, of uh, is his name Stuart Dawkins and, and that crowd, uh, know that the reigning theory now in evolutionary theory is called the theory of punctated evolution. That evolution occurs in sudden spurts, then stabilizes itself, and then does it again. Here it is, folks. This is what we're seeing here. These are uh, sudden surges in speciation, which I don't have time to go into it <clears throat> here, but in my book I'll go into it in excruciating detail. These, are, these correspond well with known periods of, uh, of uh, evolutionary surge following uh, uh, extinction events. We don't know whether these extinction events are planetesimal impacts or geomagnetic reversals, but they're very large terrestrial changes, either mediated out of Earth dynamics or from the extraterrestrial environment. So here you see it over 375 million years. Okay, now I'll resume the zoom. If anybody is, has special knowledge in some field and wants to help, that's fine, yeah. Is, is this uh, information derived from biological uh, things or paleontology or what's the... Paleontological data is what we're looking at at this scale, yeah. Um, Before you do that, like, can you show us, I don't see quite a 64 times uh, no. faster cycle yet. I mean, well, well, see how it always runs down here? That's that this is one way of mathematically portraying that spiral involution. The data could be plotted along a, a, um, a, a logarithmic spiral, but instead it's deployed here along a standard Cartesian axis. These are just different conventions about how the data should be displayed. There are ways to portray it that would show it as an involuted spiral. Okay, now let's resume. There's, there's, there's three dimensions. There's, um, it, it being a spiral and having three dimensions, does that, uh, here we're only looking at two of the dimensions. So when that spiral moves along this, when it moves along the spiral, is there something happening there that? Well, I, I mean, this is an interesting question. Um, obviously, the Earth cannot be treated as a point where novelty is concerned. Otherwise, when I laughed, you'd laugh. You know, there would be no such thing as misery in the presence of joy. There would be a homogeneous uh, medium. 
I have not figured out how to deploy the wave over three-dimensional space. With a silicon graphics machine, you could write programs to fiddle with this possibility, and then you would be able to not only predict when the novelty should show up, but where it should show up. And that, that would be uh, add a very powerful dimension of description to the thing. Okay. Um, all right. Three million years. Now remember, we began looking at six billion years. We're now looking at a much smaller amount of time. Also notice that as we get closer to the present, our data is both denser and more accurate. I mean, when we say the when eukaryotic life appeared, hell, you could be off 200 million years and it would hardly matter. But it's getting more precise. Now, on screen, we actually have very precise data about an event which occurred 65 million years ago and that was very, very temporally confined. I think I mentioned it earlier that on a certain day, 65 million years ago, <clears throat> a planetesimal object struck this planet in the vicinity of Yucatan, a subfragment impacted in, near the Solomon Islands, the fragment that struck near the Yucatan was 25 miles deep into the planetary surface in the first three seconds of the impact event. It raised a wall of rock 40,000 feet high that moved out at Mach 4 from the impact center. I mean, you cannot conceive of what this is like. And all life on this planet, larger than a chicken, died all life on this planet. The dinosaurs died in a single impact event. The evidence for this is overwhelming. The people who don't believe this have a tough and slippery road to hoe. The evidence is all over. I can state it for you if you want, but take it from me. This is as secure as any other fact in the canon of natural science. It happened, folks. And any theory of novelty would have to predict it, or it would fail. Here, here we are, 65 million years ago. There it is. There's the impact <coughs> point. Now, at this level of accuracy, in terms of m the wave and the known date of the impact, this is a bullseye for this theory. It predicted the most dramatic event in the last hundred million years, it predicted with 100% accuracy within the margins of error of the known data. Yes? And that's, a, that's an event that happens very, very fast. In other words, before that, there was no change necessarily in the level of habit or novelty. And suddenly we have this major event that happens and you go straight down. I mean, you would think, why well, isn't the, the point here? Well, uh, it's a, you're right. You're absolutely right. Well, but what has all what has given a small measure of hope to the anti-planetesimal people is the fact that it is true that a die-off was in progress for unknown reasons. In other words, in the several million years before the cometary impact, it is true that there is a uh, decline in the number of species for unknown reasons. We may get back to this in the course of the morning because I suspect that biology has a transtemporal dimension and that it was actually bracing, in a sense, bracing for the impact. But that's speculative. Yeah. Uh, was there a real convergence between the, this uh, event and uh, the graphic there? Or did you use the event as a marker to place your module when you started? No, I didn't Sorry. use this event to place the module. The two events I used were the Italian Renaissance and uh, um, the late 20th century. So you were way down. Yeah, I was way down in the, in the 
in the details of the data. It was, this is one of these successes of the theory that it correctly indicated where this planetesimal impact occurred. Was there a novel fluctuation when you discovered the timeline? Did you look back at that? Well, it's in a period of steep descent into novelty. We'll probably pass through it here. One, one, one. You're, you're back coming in from the end of the Mayan calendar. Wouldn't that just have one peak every 64th uh, cycle? In which case, what are all the little peaks for? In other words, wouldn't you just say there's a peak of novelty at each of those, you know, the apex of the of the curve? But how can you add all the all the little ones? Well, where do they come from? Well, I, oh, I guess I didn't. The part of it that I spared you was remember when I said I got loaded and I figured out how to mathematically collapse the wave, the the occult diagram into the Cartesian wave. It's built into this. It's built into this. I just spared you the the mathematical details of how this was done. It's trivial, but but maddening. So it's all explained in my published stuff. It's all been gone over by professionals. It's solid. It's just too much to expect a non-mathematical audience to put up with. Okay? Okay. So 93 million years on the screen. Now we're going to zoom again. Forty-six million years, twenty-three million years, eleven million years. This is our story. This is our story. Yes. You covered most of the mathematics and basis of, of the theory of this and the invisible landscape. Um, yes, and the invisible landscape will be republished on the fifteenth of April in a new edition from Harper. So if you enjoyed true hallucinations but wondered what the real basis for all that was, the, the invisible landscape is an absolutely uncompromising and pitiless uh, <laughs> revelation of all of this stuff. Uh, okay, the last 11 million years. Now, this is the period in which the primates go from being one of many complex mammalian orders to emerging as something of quite a different order. Bipedalism, binocular vision, the descent from the trees, the coordination of language, so forth and so on. And you know, they're moving these skeletons around all the time, homo habiles, um, um, <coughs> the, the whole pantheon of skeleton, mater skeletal material that backs up the theory of human origins. What this basically shows is that for the last 11 million years, there has been a fairly smooth descent into novelty uh, that reached a, a kind of equilibrium about 5 million years ago, and that's when you get the earliest hominoids, and then went along oscillating more or less around the mean, and these low points, which we'll look at in more detail, are glaciations, until about a hundred thousand years ago and then there was an even deeper 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 plunge into novelty and remember this is all being generated from december 21 2012 and we're now looking at a, at only 11 million years a tiny fraction of the time we began with on the screen so let me zoom again and i should say I'm using this zoom function, but the software has many, many functions. We could choose out any portion of this and explode the data endlessly. And uh, there are all kinds of functions that I, are not being discussed here because there simply isn't enough time. Zoom? Yes. Sorry. Zoom? Yes. Seek minimum? No. Approach factor? Two. Eleven. Let's look at this for a minute. Now, notice that the theory is not shy about making predictions. It is very clear and concise. I mean, these predictions, if you wanted to, are to the minute. 
as to where the novelty maxima fell. I mean, if we went into one of these troughs and blew it up and blew it up and blew it up, we could get right down to the minute. It is an incredibly mathematically precise and unambiguous thing. Now, it, all it predicts is where the novelty will occur. It doesn't say what the novelty will be. By being so conservative in what it says happens, it gains great explanatory power in saying when it will happen. It's almost like the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where you can either state the position or the velocity of a particle, but you cannot state the position and the velocity. As one comes into focus, the other loses resolution. Uh, these are glaciations. And when you compare it to the established data on glaciations that petrologists and paleontologists have assembled, the agreement is striking. You know, there is excellent agreement with the data on every level. This is the last five million years, and, and what it, this is the extraordinary environment in which human beings were hammered out on the anvil of evolution. And it's clear what was going on, that one thing that was driving evolution was because of these glaciations, gene populations were repeatedly being islanded, indemnified, and then the glaciers would melt and these indemnified gene pools would flow together and create unique genetic combinations. Then the glaciers would come again, re-indemnify the gene pool, then melt again. And as you see, this happened over and over again. Well, this is a strategy for pumping novelty out of a, bio, out of a biome, out of a biological uh, system. Uh, okay, now, so the, the, the evolution of the proto-hominids is going along across here. These are a combination of glaciations, geomagnetic reversals, and climatary fluctuations. And when you put all this data together, it, it is in pretty striking agreement with this, which is generated, remember, always simply out of the I Ching. I mean, this is a pure mathematical abstraction. Okay, now let's go forward. Five million years on the screen, 2.9 million years on the screen, 1.4 million years on the screen. Now, some of you may have noticed, just as an aside, that occasionally a screen will go by that you may have the impression you've seen it before. This is because every eight levels with an approach factor of two, the topology will repeat, but the numerical valuation is always unique. Every point in the wave has a unique numerical valuation, but the topological relationship repeats in a series of fractal resonances. Uh, well, by factors, of, by multiplicands of 64. See, I mean, eight, yeah, by multiple, multiples of 64. Okay, so this is the same picture that we had on the screen when we had six billion years on the screen, remember? So now the fact that we have this pattern again is an opportunity for me to talk about a, a, another level of this theory, which is resonance. Because patterns repeat themselves, this is a theory of time as a kind of interference pattern as a series of resonances. So, remember I said this is where the Earth condenses? Well, this is also where the cometary impact fell that extinguished the dinosaurs. Remember that one? It's also uh, the descent into uh, human organization a million years ago. I mean, by this time, the genus Homo is beginning to make its influence felt in Africa. I mean, this is really the descent into humanness along this gradient here. Uh, 
the oldest homo sapien skeleton known to exist that is anatomically indistinguishable from modern human beings is from the Classis River Cave mouth site a uh, hundred thousand years ago. People that looked exactly like you and me as far as we can tell from the skeletal remains. Let's go forward and look at that. of two always just to keep it consistent here okay 1.4 million years 700 million years I mean 700,000 years 360,000 years 183,000 years on the screen here is the rapid evolutionary descent that stabilizes homo sapiens sapien as he as he and she exist today right there this is the beginning of authentic humanness. And you see then that once the human type was established, then there is a fluctuation around the mean, obviously uh, epidemics, migrations, uh, minor local extinctions, uh, minor climatary fluctuations, so forth and so on. But from here on, Look how close to the singularity of the zero point the thing is operating. And I should say, you know, you need to link what I'm saying here with what I said yesterday about how time is not pushed from behind by causal necessity. Time is drawn toward the future by the presence of a singularity, the attractor. Tractor I'm locating at the winter solstice of 2012 AD, which is right down here. So uh, what we're saying is that novelty, there is a kind of ultimate novelty dwell in the universe, which the process of universal evolution is orbiting around in a decaying orbit that moves it faster and faster, and eventually it will actually fall into the event horizon of the singularity, and that this is now only 18 years in the future. That's the hard swallow. Every theory, let, let me say this about the hard swallow. Every theory has a hard swallow. If it seems absurd to you that the, that the Earth could transform itself in a single few hours, 18 years in the future, Remember what orthodoxy teaches. The orthodox faith is that the universe sprang from nothing in a single moment for no reason. So if you sneer at this singularity, just be aware that your drawers are open because uh, <coughs> science is balanced on an initial axiomatic absurdity that defies scaling, you know? I mean, you can't imagine anything less likely than that the universe would spring from nothing in a single moment, yes? So this is a, this is a map of time, but all the points that you show are related to mankind, not the universe. It's strictly on planet Earth. This, how do we know what else is going to you, you're, us the center of the universe and everything that happens as here. Yes, exactly. Because uh, I think a fair examination of nature will lead to the conclusion that nature tends to concentrate novelty uh, at a cutting edge. For a long time, the cutting edge was physics. Then. Uh, chemistry replaced physics as the cutting edge. Then biology replaced physics as the cutting edge. Then culture replaced biology, and global electronic culture replaced culture. The interesting thing about this theory is, one of the interesting things, is unlike science, which says you are an irrelevant spectator, who by sheer happenstance happens to be in this universe, this theory says you are the child of the cosmos. You are important. 
humanity matters. The human drama is an extension of the drama of life, which is the drama of matter. It once again makes human beings metaphysically central to the process of being. It re-empowers us as uh, central players in the emergence of novelty on a cosmic scale. That's right. Yeah. Are Nowhere else in the physical universe that there are like, people like us or other organisms higher in the culture. Why not in physical universe? Well, it doesn't really make a statement about that. What it is is uh, a, a wave mechanical description of the evolution of novelty on the Earth, and it makes no statement about the extraterrestrial environment. However, as we'll see, we don't get many opportunities to predict extraterrestrial events, but as we will see, the cometary impact on Jupiter next July, it does pick up. That's maybe an indication that it is a solar system-wide wave system rather than a planetary-wide wave system, but I see no reason to extend it further than the If you recall that, then the, the applicability is really Earth itself. Well, I, I, I follow your thinking, but I'm not sure I agree with it. Uh, when, when I try to think about how could someone have figured this out, let's, accept, let's accept for a moment that maybe this is true, then how in the hell could somebody have figured this out? Here's what I imagine as the basis of it. I imagine a prehistorical civilization somewhere in Central Asia uh, that is psychologically and in its cultural values very different from us and that is involved in something which for want of a better word let's call meditation and let's leave out the issue of whether it's psychedelically driven or not. Let's just call it meditation. It is true that a very deep set of meditation techniques called the, um, called the clearing of the heart techniques can be traced back to that generally same geographical area. So here's what I imagine. Experimental spiritual people meditating and, you know, there's a whole thing in the I Ching about meditation. It's the hexagram keeping still, which says, you know, you, and, and that's what these stilling the heart techniques are about, is keeping still. And I think what's hinted at here is a kind of yoga where by keeping still, by suppressing heartbeat, breath, suppressing all the gross functions of the body, the observing mind falls in to the quantum mechanical foundations of biology and there you see flux, you see something, you see change and if you watch it a lifetime, a century, a millennia as a brotherhood or a sisterhood of, of people accumulating and passing on data, eventually you can make statements about this flux. Statements such as, it is composed of parts. Its parts are not infinite in number. In fact, its parts are 64 in number. And so I think that what they were doing was they were actually, they were experientially practicing quantum mechanics by giving a phenomenologically accurate description of the ebb and flow of quantum bioelectronic flux in the body, and they created a notation system, just the way chemists created a notation system for the, temp for the physical elements. They created this system of 64 notations and said, you know, this kind of flux is related to human concepts of innocence, the unexpected. This kind of flux is related to the human concept of the well, or the marrying maiden, or the army, or something else. In other words, the hexagrams. So I think the whole of the universe, including, and this refers to your comment, including the lunation cycles, are actually built up 
out of resonances that come out of the quantum mechanical domain. Do you see how that could work? Yeah. Um, following that line of thought, is it possible to use uh, this graphics for personal um, information as a, as a normal thing? Well, that's an interesting question, too. Uh, let me answer for The question was, is it possible to use this wave as a personal description of the ebb and flow of novelty in your own life? Yeah, oh yeah, the next 18 years, no, we'll get to that. Uh, here, but let me follow this thing through about the personal um, thing. This was also a crisis for astrology. Astrology was originally a tool of statecraft used to chart um, the destiny of the Imperium. It was only in Hellenistic times when a yuppie class evolved inside Hellenistic civilization that there became a market for personal horoscopes and then it began to be developed. Uh, one thing you can do, and I am not, I, I mean, this is all experiment, this isn't dogma, but one thing you can do that's very interesting is you can take your birth date 67 years, 104.25 days to your birth date, and enter that date as the end date, instead of 20, uh, December 21st, 2012. And if you enter that date as an end date, striking numbers of people claim that it gives a good description of the ebb and flow of novelty in their own lives. Now, I'm not sure that's true, if it's true, here's my interpretation of what that means. It means that this big wave that we're looking at should be thought of as the average of all the little waves that we each represent. I'm one, you're one, you're one. Everybody and everything has a wave associated with it. Every person, every plant, every animal. And the sum total of these waves is the universal wave. And you can argue top down or bottom up. It really doesn't, uh, doesn't matter. Yeah. Can you comment about the uh, meteor that's hitting Jupiter? Mm -hmm. and, and there was a question brought up about how this describes the experience on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to put that together. Would that mean that, that uh, it wouldn't seem like a comet hitting Jupiter has anything to do with Earth unless uh, this uh, model applies to, to habit in the reverse across the universe? Well, we'll look at the Jupiter impact because what it says is uh, that the most novel of week of this year on this planet will be the week of, Ju of July 21st. But it's not terribly novel. It's just the most novel week of this year. So it picks it up in the sense that the planetesimal impact on Jupiter falls in the bottom of the novelty trough, but it's not a catastrophically deep or planet reshaping novelty trough. It's just the low point of the year. Oh, yes, no, I don't think it will only be that. I, I'm just saying, you know, Yeah, I say that we already know that at the low point of novelty of this year, we already know of one really weird thing sure to happen, which is this impact point on Jupiter. Often there are low points in the way where you don't know what the fulfillment is until you get there. But in this particular one, we already know because we can compute from Newtonian mechanics the decay of the orbit of this object, so we know when it's going to crash into the Earth. Uh, okay, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. Wanted, I just wanted to say, you know, you were talking about your thoughts on the meditative thing and the the arising of this concept, uh, and you mentioned uh, keeping still. And if you remember the Willem uh, Baines text, it, it actually says keeping his stopping still. And if you go back and look at the archaic Chinese text, it is the picture for the heart with the line that means to stop the heart. And it can be interpreted as stopping or as what you're, exactly the interpretation that you just said. So yeah. the archaic texts support absolutely that. The interpretation. 
Okay, now let's zoom in again, because uh, I want to get into history with you, because that's where the that's where the pedal meets the metal, because that's where we really have the data. I mean, it's one thing to talk about biological history. It's quite another to look at the last thousand years. Okay, there's 183,000 years on the screen. The last 100,000 years, the last 45,000 years, and now I want to talk about it again. The last 22,000 years. Remember this signature before? The condensation of the earth, the extinction of the dinosaurs, the emergence of the hominids, and then this is the melt, the last glacial melt occurred 22,000 years ago. Before that, the ice was as far south as Seattle. It was as far south as Baalbek in Lebanon. It began to break up. Then this period here, up until about 9,000 BC, this is the climax of what I'm calling this partnership paradise this psilocybin-based, uh, African, nomadic, orgiastic um, social system that was the last sane moment we ever knew. Uh, you know, it, it is in this trough here that uh, courage, altruism, love, self-sacrifice, community values, language, uh, well, I don't know about language. Language is older, but uh, it, it, it all came together here. This is what Rian Eisler and Maria Gambutis and the enthusiasts of the partnership interpretation of Paleolithic time is all about. And then we know that, and then it's clear, something went wrong. You can see that something went wrong. There was a reversion to habit. There was a halt. In the, in the forward descent into novelty. Well, now we know from the archaeological record that right at this time, and notice that this is just as, this is the invention of agriculture. It's 9,000. BP, BC, 11,000 BP. Okay, uh, across Europe, the Middle East, Central Russia, in the stratigraphy of this time period, we find what archaeologists call the Tanged Point Technocomplex. The Tanged Point Technocomplex uh, is a situation where a, a distinctive kind of arrowhead is found in large assemblages of arrowheads. It is before this in stratigraphic levels older than 11,000 BP, if you find a, an arrow point, you find one arrow point. It means that somebody lost this in hunting. The Tanged Point Technocomplex is different. You find assemblages of arrow points, and these are not arrow point factories. What they are is they are sites of battles between human populations. War is invented here. This is the crisis point. Africa is drying. The mushroom is disappearing. Under the pressure of that, agriculture is being invented. Warfare is being invented. The ego is being invented as psilocybin is washed out of the human population. The old primate wiring is re-emerging, and right here, Male dominance, slavery, warfare, defense of sedentary populations, etc., etc., etc. It all is invented along here. This is uh, the fall. And as you see, it represents a significant deviation from the forward thrust into novelty that would have been a continuation of this line here. A return to a primate pattern suppressed by hallucinogens for a hundred thousand years? No, it represents a return to genetic programming, to pre-existing habit, to animal organization triumphing over consciousness. It's a true setback, I, I would think. It's a recursion to a print to an earlier 
pattern of behavior. That's habit by any measure. Yeah. Are all the um, resonance screens um, topologically exactly the same or just similar? Well, there are what we call direct resonances, which are topologically equivalent. And then there are near or indirect resonances, which are topologically close. And then you can set up a ranking system for that. I mean, there's a great deal about this that I'm not going to cover today. Uh, okay, now I want to go in just a little bit more. Do you see how this works? Eleven thousand years. Now, this is what I wanted to talk about. Here's the tang point. Here's the invention of agriculture, the establishment of agriculture, the tank point, techno complex, so forth and so on. But human creativity and human consciousness being what it is, you can't keep a good person down. So about 7,200 years ago begins a tremendous plunge into novelty, which reaches a deeper penetration toward the eschatonic attractor than has previously been achieved in the whole history of life on the planet. What is this? What is this? Well, some of you may know the work of an archaeologist named James Mellart, who excavated at a place in Turkey called Çatalhöyük. And Çatalhöyük is, was a city of 9,000 people practicing a goddess religion. 20% uh, of the living space was dedicated to shrines, to a cattle goddess. It was, I maintain, the last uh, bastion of this earlier African goddess-centered cattle religion. And there's considerable archaeology to support this uh, idea because many of the motifs on the pottery at Chatal, southern Turkey, are African animals, vultures and bison and this sort of thing. So Chatal Hiyuk flourished, and if you read the archaeological books about it, the archaeologists can barely contain themselves. I mean, this is 3,000 years before the building of the pyramids, and this is a civilization with flush toilets, glass, uh, so forth and so on. A city of astonishing size, technical advancement, aesthetic magnificence, uh, evidently large amounts of leisure time, so forth and so on. If any of you are interested, read Chatal Hyuyuk, a Neolithic town in southern Turkey by James Mallard. Uh, fascinating stuff. This is 7,200 years ago. 7200 BP, uh, BC, and in 6500 BC, Chatalhyuk is destroyed. Le Chatal levels 5A and 6 show evidence of enormously hot fires sweeping through the entire structure. It ends right there. What happened? We know what happened. The, the black cats came. Those folks from north of Lake Van in Central Asia, the wheeled chariot people, the horse-mounted people, the Indo-Europeans, our people, the people who had uh, domesticated the horse and invented the wheel and had simultaneously invented an entirely new lifestyle for human beings rape and pillage over large distances supported by wheeled vehicles and horsepower. And they, we know then that the Indo-European waves of invasion were coming across the Anatolian plateau at that time. They destroyed Chatal Hyuyuk and follows a period of retraction, habituation, return to earlier forms, but again, so much technology, language, and sophistication had accumulated that it was very hard to keep that commitment to habit and ha to habit and recidivism going. So up here, there's a symmetry break, you see? And then, in perfect 
agreement with the wave, you get like strings, like pearls on a string, descending down this gradient deeper into novelty, you get Sumer, Ur, Chaldea, Babylon, Egypt. The wave actually supports the theosophical hallucination that Egypt attained a cultural level never before attained in, in the history of the earth and not surpassed until Hellenistic times. That's the fact of the matter and the wave portrays it perfectly. Yeah. At the bottom of the trough, we also have simultaneously the creation of stone of uh, New Grange and directly going up the thing, uh, the Stonehenge too. Yes, this trough of novelty here, these, this is the culmination of a, a kind of echo of our own history. See how this gradient here is like an echo of this gradient here? This is the sweep from Sumer to the Great Pyramid. This is the sweep from Minoan Crete to the Eschaton and Star Flight. So it's, a, it's like an echo. It's almost as though history happened twice and ended the first time around 2300 BC and then began again around 940 BC and swept toward the millennial, uh, the, the Mayan millennial moment of December 21st, 2012. Um, so, and here's history's fractal mountain, you know, from the Great Pyramid to Michael Jackson, right here. <laughs> <laughs> history's fractal mountain, yes. Rise and habit up to the, the last peak of right? I'll uh, explode it and talk about it. Zip, 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 zip. There it is. So the question was, if the great... Now, this being Maui, I hope we're not about to cross a Rubicon here. The Great Pyramid was, the cornerstone was placed in September 2790 BC. If you have a different date, it's your problem to defend it. Uh, 50,000 years ago, placed by Vagans, passing by 20 million years ago, you've got a tough row to hoe. It was placed in September of 2790 BC. Uh, you know, you just have to like it or lump it. Um, so here it is, right down here. And then what we see, and, and I don't know how much you know about Egyptian history, but uh, the Great Pyramid is built at the end of a period of civilized unfoldment and is immediately followed by a collapse of Egyptian society. For about 250 years, no monuments are dedicated and no buildings of any major size are built. The, the Great Pyramid marks the end of what is called the Old Kingdom. The New Kingdom, or what's called Dynastic Egypt, begins then about 250 years later. There was some kind of social collapse in that period that we don't know very much about. Something happened. Then, from, from the beginning of, the, of dynastic Egypt on, they're always looking back to the Golden Age. I mean, even a thousand years before Christ, the Egyptians were talking about the good old days and how could they get back to it and so forth and so on. So then, what the wave shows is after the achievements of Egyptian civilization, uh, a, a, a conservative, habitual, recidivist, and traditional return to patterns occurred, although it's quite dramatically punctuated with certain developments. If we look at the civilizations of the ancient world and place them along this gradient, uh, what we discover here is uh, a whole bunch of badass characters. Uh, the Mitanni, a warrior people of uncertain origin. They conquer Egypt. They're followed by the Hyskos, an even more brutal 
and conquering people who leave no textual evidence and very little evidence of any civilization other than what they had ripped off from the higher civilizations they had conquered. That's followed by the Assyrians, equally badass. And, and so what we have are a, a series of ever more warlike, male-dominated, slave-run imperial states basing their economies on chariot-driven warfare and conquest. And that happened, that continues. Now, there are some important deviations from this. Uh, the Phoenicians invent writing in the bottom of this trough here. And then there is this symmetry break up here at the top in terms of, uh, of uh, real history. That point, 948 AD, is when Minoan Crete, the last bastion of the goddess-worshipping culture that had been preserved out of Africa at Chatalhyuk, falls to Mycenaean pirates. Uh, this is the age of Agamemnon. This is the age when Homer sang his song. Homer sings his song at the top of this crest. And I had a professor of history at Cal who said, if you want to know where it all went wrong, it all went wrong when the Greeks stopped being fishermen and pulled their boats up onto the shore and started talking philosophy. That's when it all went wrong. And that's what this shows. It shows that there was an enormous shift in cultural values that created the cascade into novelty that leads in an almost direct line to our own predicament, and that is, uh, is certainly true. So now I'll, I'll you know, any questions on that? Okay, I'll zoom in now. This is from 589 AD to 1998. The screen is filled with predictions. It's not shy. It's not sight of hand. It says where the novelty was and where it wasn't. How's it doing? Is it getting it right? Because you see, there's a certain kind of intellectual obligation building here. If it's right, and right, and right, and right, and right, then it must be ultimately right. And in that case, the world is about to transform itself. We are so close to, the, to being absorbed into the event horizon of the eschatonic object that all you have to do is smoke a bomber or sit and daydream, and you can see it behind closed eyelids. I mean, it is impinging on 20th century history with the impact of the sun rising over a darkened landscape. It is here. It is here. <clears throat> Just a minute. <laughs> so, uh, or I'm... This is the Dark Ages here, when culture fell so low in Europe that the Byzantine thinker Microbius claimed that the circumference of a circle was twice its diameter. That's what happened to uh, science in Europe in the Dark Ages. If it hadn't been for the Arabs preserving these Greek manuscripts in monasteries, we would have essentially gone back to a pre-Greek level of civilization. So the Arab thing was very central there. Okay, then what it shows is an incredible descent into novelty in the middle 10th century. 
several things are going on. First of all, let's just get rid of the Maya. That's them taking the final dive, walking out of their cities, so forth and so on. But in terms of global novelty, the collapse of the Maya had very little consequence on Chinese, Indian, or European history. In fact, zero consequences. It wasn't even going to be known that they existed for several hundred years into the future. But what was happening that was having an impact on all of the rest of global culture was at Cordoba and at uh, Baghdad, uh, Islamic rulers, the Umayyads, uh, in the case of Baghdad, were establishing uh, incredible patronage of the science and the arts and architecture and uh, uh, design, engineering, and out of all that comes the invention of algebra, which may not seem like a big thing, but it lays the basis for the calculus and hence modern science. So this plunge into novelty is really the birth of modern science under the aegis of the Umayyads and the Cordovan Caliphs, uh, and has very little to do with Europe, okay? Okay, then uh, the next one, the next plunge into novelty is over here. It's not as deep as that one, and it doesn't fall from so high a point, but nevertheless, it's dramatic. 1122, the Crusades, specifically the Second Crusade, which was the important one. What this means is that the insularity of Christian Europe begins to dissolve under the impact of contact with the Orient. And it had the impact on Europe that trade with an extraterrestrial civilization would have today. I mean, they had never seen silk brocades, perfume, pearls, spices. A psychedelic stuff is what it was and it was pouring into Europe and creating new classes of people, new canons of aesthetics, new types of music, architecture, so forth and so on. But then this return to habit here is what I call the medieval eschaton, the freezing out. You know, this is the, the high Gothic era where Europe is locked in contemplation of the teachings of the Galilean, no science exists. Art is only in the service of religion. Politics serves religion. Everything is locked in the contemplation of the Christian uh, message. And then look, something happens here. A startling collapse into novelty in the middle 1300s, reaching its apex, reaching its deepest descent into novelty, in the year 1356. What happened in 1356? One third of the population of Europe dies in 18 months under the influence of the Black Plague. The greatest demographic collapse Europe has ever experienced, and it came from Central Asia, where we have no data, but we can presume that it killed as many people in those places as it did in Europe. Uh, it was a tremendously novel event in that many people died, but society rebounded rather quickly to its old habits because it did not represent a technological innovation or an intellectual breakthrough like the invention of algebra. It was simply a catastrophe, and society responded by returning rather quickly to the previous levels. I mean, if this is 1356, the top of this puppy is 1440. So in a hundred years, it, they were able to sort of re-establish European inst cultural institutions and come out of that body blow. In now, but obviously, there was a tremendous symmetry break up here at the top of this thing. And I want to magnify it so we can see it here. 